I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spend Up ahead the road is in me Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. Many of us head out on the open road to get away from it all. Not Airstream trailer buffs. Some sort of magnetism pulls them and their machines together. Ha, hey, he, ho, who, huh. An ancient language helps bind the Cherokee tribe. An ancient language with an alphabet, thanks to a Cherokee scholar. There is loneliness to be found on the road. Near San Francisco, someone sculpted loneliness out of driftwood. To get out of man's way, the wild horses of Montana have to just keep running. But first, we meet Heidi Harrelson, the speed demon oyster shucker of Apalachicola. Aw, shucks, she says. And she shucks and shucks and shucks. Oysters are beautiful to look at and wonderful to eat, of course, but very ornery and hard to open. This is Apalachicola Bay. And if you bring your oyster here to have it opened, it just happens you've come to the right place. The bay is lined with oyster houses, and half the population hereabouts make their living shucking oysters. But in this universe of oyster shuckers, one stands out like a pearl in a bushel of blue points. Nobody can shuck oysters like Heidi Harrelson. See? You just put it there. See, there's a hole. And then you get your string on it, yeah? See? I hope you are paying attention because this is like a free boxing lesson from Muhammad Ali. At the annual contest, Heidi Harrelson became the national oyster shucking champion, the first woman ever to win. When it comes right down to it, uh, how fast can you open oysters? I, I shock here uh, 50 oysters in 2 minutes and 39 seconds. All right, 50 oysters? In 2 minutes and 39 seconds. 2 minutes, 39 seconds. Yeah. If I race with somebody, I can make more. <laughs> I have to have a competition. <laughs> you don't become a world-class oyster shucker overnight, of course. When Heidi Harrelson came here from her native Alsace-Lorraine, she didn't know what an oyster was. When her man left her, she went to shucking. She's got another man now, her husband, George Harrelson, who shucks beside her, but she can outshuck him two to one. She knows what an oyster is. She knows how to get into an oyster. She's just good at it. I believe she was uh, made to shuck oysters. <laughs> she is already national champion. Tomorrow, the world. She's headed for the International Oyster Shucking Championship in Ireland. Do you uh, feel in your heart you're the best oyster shucker in the world? I don't know. I'm fast. <laughs> Every evening as the sun goes down on Apalachicola Bay, the oyster boats pull into the miracle seafood dock. Thousands upon thousands of recalcitrant oysters, every one of them hard to open. They are wheeled up the dock toward the building where Heidi Harrelson, her flashing oyster knife in hand, stands waiting. Let me tell you something. Those oysters have met their match. A flip of the wrist and another oyster in the bucket. She's the champ. Oyster shuckers at Miracle Seafood discard their shells in a chute that leads to the outside where the shells pile up. One pile is bigger than all the others.
Every time we pass down Interstate 80 on the way into San Francisco, we see them. These silent sculptures staring back at the freeway from the tidal marshes of San Francisco Bay. The sculptures keep changing, but they're always here. And this time we decided to stop, to seek for clues to who puts them here and why. There aren't any clues. The sculptures are just here, that's all, standing as mysteriously on the Emeryville mud flats as the stones of Stonehenge or those big heads on Easter Island. A steam locomotive with a hubcap headlamp and a rusty oil drum smokestack pulls a train of driftwood cars, but nobody knows how it got here. A plywood rhinoceros. A sea monster with green foam rubber football pupils. A grasshopper with bowling pin antennae. The sculptures are made from whatever flotsam floats in from the sea. We must have passed this place a dozen times over the years, and I can't remember ever seeing the same sculpture twice. The big tides come in and sweep the mud flats clean. But then a week or two later, mysteriously, a new junk masterpiece rises, then another, then another. Because, of course, the same storm that destroys the old sculptures brings in building materials for the new ones. The show keeps changing. The stars of the show this week are a friendly dragon, a Trojan horse or unicorn, a driftwood owl with old tires and antifreeze bottle eyes, and a serene angel worthy of the heavenly choir or of a real art gallery with a roof on it. But the art in this gallery is as fragile as it is whimsical. It will last only until the next big wind or high tide. Over here, somebody built a sphinx, a very fine sphinx with hubcap eyes. And then, of course, somebody else built a pyramid. And then, inspired by this little Egypt of the mud flats, somebody constructed a phoenix, the mythical bird rising from the ashes, or in this case, from the mud and the junk. Out of the ooze, art. This place is too close to the big city to survive. One of these days, of course, they're going to clean up the Emeryville mud flats and build a shopping center here. And that'll be the end of all this. When commerce intrudes, art departs. It'll be too bad. The drive down Interstate 80 will be a little less fun for the lack of speculation about who made these sculptures. Nobody speculates about who built a shopping center. But driftwood to driftwood and dust to dust. This Indian chief on horseback this guitar-playing mule are doomed to become junk, which is what they were to start with before some anonymous mudflat Michelangelo's brought a little fancy into our lives. To be free, really free, that's something modern man doesn't know very much about. But here in this part of the Montana wilderness, it is possible to glance to the top of a ridgeline and there catch a fleeting glimpse of freedom. It's a sight you don't soon forget, a wild stallion and a band of mares staring back at you from a rim of Sundance sandstone and then turning away and disappearing as free as the wind. These prior mountains, desert and badland country on the Montana-Wyoming border are a kind of last frontier for the Mustangs and if you want to witness their wildness and freedom and grace, you have to travel for hours along rocky jeep trails as we have done today, watch the ridge lines, and be prepared to catch your breath at the sight of them. Many of these horses, no doubt, are descendants of those that carried Sioux warriors against Custer at the Little Bighorn, 50 miles from here. This range has been theirs that long. The Federal Bureau of Land Management, concerned about overgrazing and erosion, announced plans to destroy the herd. The horses, said the Bureau, will be trapped at water holes and sold at public auction. There was a public outcry, and now the Bureau says the horses can stay, at least for the present. A man who led the fight, who actually went to court against the government on this issue, has an isolated ranch bordering the Mustang Range, rancher Lloyd Tillett. They're good, strong horses. Mm -hmm. we got a heavy, got a real good girth. 
and they've got a lot of a lot of endurance. You can ride them for. Well, I've got a, one that I used to ride a lot. He's kind of pensioned off now, but I remember one time I took him for. I had him for four days, and I was taking a bunch of cattle. And at night I just tie him up to a tree or wherever I happened to be. And the next day, why I'd get on him, and all he got to eat was just what he was, what he'd pick along when I was taking his cattle along. And it didn't seem to bother him too much. Fact is, he threw my wife off, <laughs> put her in a hospital at the end of it. <laughs> If they were ever rounded up and sold, what would happen to them? Well, a majority of them would go into a cannon factory for dogs. Dog food and cat food. You'd rather see them running free? I would rather see them running free than that. So wild horses have friends after all. These few have survived highways and fences and scientific range management, and they are still here, blacks, browns, and roans, unbroken, utterly enviable, the possessors of these hills, proud and pretty and free. Trailers, as everybody knows, are a wonderful way to get away from it all. Consider the Shingleton family of North Carolina. With a trailer, they have been able to come to Florida and enjoy the sunshine. The only thing is, when they got here, they found they had a little company. What this is, is a rally of Airstream trailer owners. They are all happy to be here together. But surveying this scene, it's hard to escape an unsettling vision of an American future in which we are all encased in aluminum cocoons, on wheels, but with no place left to go. The Airstreamers, however, don't see it that way. They gladly pay $4,000 to $14,000 apiece for their trailers, and then several times a year travel thousands of miles for what? For the privilege of shoehorning themselves into the midst of thousands of other trailers just like theirs. Once here, they organize committees and activities with a zeal that would shame a Kiwanis club. They like to do everything together, starting strenuously at the blast of dawn. We hop and we pop, but our blood begins to circulate. We're feeling mighty good. And the more we run, the more you enjoy your food. Oh, we run with ease and we shout with glee. With plenty of endurance, we are filled with energy. When they can be persuaded to pause from their exercises, apron-making contests, choir practice, and golden rule committee meetings, the caravanners declare themselves well satisfied with this way of living. Don't you every now and then uh, yearn for the old home place, though? I thought that was a basic American urge to uh, settle down at the old uh, Well, you've home. settled long enough. Now it's kind of fun to be put back, uh, really, not tied down any certain place. Usually one or the other, though, in the beginning. Yeah. Either the husband misses his home or the wife does. But then you get over it after a while. And you just don't have a home at all? No. On the road. Home away from home. <laughs> home away. It's a home away from home, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's it, exactly. It's great. I think it's great later in life to do this. It's wonderful. It's good therapy. Any disadvantages to trailer life? Well, if you got a little husband, it's better than a big husband. You got more room to move inside. <laughs> All of the trailers are emblazoned with big red numbers. The way that works is you see a number, say 13258. You go for your catalog and membership list. Isn't that? Yes, it is. 13258 is Gerald and Dorothy Crapnell from Virginia. Remember them? If you're a caravanner, you don't want to be anonymous. And if you have a big red number, you're not. The Airstream Company encourages their togetherness with a full-time way-of-life division that plans far-flung rallies. Just in case you hadn't noticed, the campers, trailers, and motorhomes in America today number nearly three million. You'd expect to find a good deal of diversity among that many people rolling down the road, but those here are remarkably alike, almost all middle-aged, all white, and all American. And if there's anything they hate to do, it's say goodbye to one another. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That wherever you may travel, a star will guide you. The sun will warm your face. The wind be ever at your back. The road rise up to meet you. And God hold you in the hollow of his hand. Now, hundreds of these people will be taking the same roads west. The Sarasota rally is over, but nobody has to be alone for long. There's another one coming right up in Salem, Oregon. We know how he looked. We know he wore a turban and smoked a pipe. We know he lived out the last years of his life up here in the grassy hills of the Cherokee Nation. We know he walked with a limp. We know he never went to school, never learned to speak English. We know people said he was crazy. We know his name, Sequoia. That's nearly all we know, except for this, that he was one of the great geniuses of our history. Long before the white men came, the Cherokee, living in orderly villages like this one recreated at Chalaki, achieved a culture and philosophy and government of their own. But one thing the centuries failed to provide them, failed to provide any of the Indian civilizations of the Americas, a written language. This one man, Sequoia, this madman, as his tribesmen thought of him, observed that many things were found out by the Cherokee and known in the world, but that this knowledge escaped. He had seen white people write things down on paper and make them fast. To do that, he told a friend, would be like catching a wild animal and taming it. From about 1809 to about 1821, he apparently largely ignored his family. He let his farm grow up in briars. He suffered the contempt of his neighbors. He spent hours every day out in the woods drawing pictures on little pieces of bark. He accumulated hundreds of these bark pictures which had meaning for him alone. After about 10 years of that, his wife, after an argument, gathered up all Sequoia's bark pictures and threw them in the fire. Sequoia started over. After two more years, he had perfected the Cherokee alphabet. He turned to the one person who had no reason not to believe in him, his six-year-old daughter, Ayoka. He taught her to read and write her own language in a week. 86 characters representing every syllable in the Cherokee language. Sequoia and his daughter demonstrated the written language to the most distinguished Cherokee chiefs assembled in council. And abruptly, the laughter stopped. In time, the presses rolled. In time, a very short time really, there was a Cherokee newspaper. And not long after that, a Cherokee Bible. And codified for the first time by any American Indians, the constitution and laws of the Cherokee Nation. Ha, hey, he. Ho, who, huh. Sequoia's La, alphabet has lay, bound the Cherokees together for 150 lay, years. La. It survived, Ma, though thousands ya, of Cherokees ye, did not. Ye, the brutal yo, forced march by the United so, States Army of the Eastern so, Cherokees to Oklahoma da, along the Trail of Tears. Lay, lay, it survived ye, all the succeeding ye, trials go, of the great ya, civilized tribe, epidemic, this. poverty, and discrimination. So, All right. It is taught today so, to Cherokee one. students by Cherokee teachers who learned it in their childhood. What is Milk. 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 Like right. Mrs. Anna Kilpatrick then, Smith of Northeastern uh, State College at Tahlequah. There. Sequoia's accomplishment lives. The legacy of an American who did what no one else has ever done, made himself and his whole people literate in their own language, and did it entirely alone, working in the darkness toward a light only he could see. 
Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years, I've been a wanderer. Just when I think I'm near the end, I always see the road is bending. And I wonder what's around the bend.